Okay, so we continue with the third lecture uh, in CMP 591, uh, Broadband Wireless Networks. Remember, in the last lecture, uh, we discussed the distributed uh, coordination function, and now we continue with the point coordination function in uh, IEEE 802.11 systems. So the point coordination function is again inside the MAC layer. It's uh, available in all standards, but it's not widely used. Uh, the point coordination function supports optional Wi-Fi Alliance approved devices. It is contention free. Actually, it is mostly used for providing quality of service since it's contention free. And it increases, unfortunately, the MAC overhead. That's why it's not preferred. So this time in uh, PCF, as opposed to what happened with uh, the distributed coordination function, the time is divided into super frames. And in each super frame, uh, you have two periods. There's the contention free period and then the contention period. At the start of each super frame, the access point typically broadcasts a beacon, first of all, declaring which access point it is. Uh, with each beacon is uh, actually an access point is uh, broadcasting a new Wi-Fi system. It's called uh, an SSID. Uh, from one uh, access point, actually, it is possible to broadcast multiple wireless networks. That's typically what we have uh, in our university. Uh, you both have the CMP wireless LAN, but in addition, you can also see the Bone wireless LAN, and also, as you can see, the EDIROM and CMP ROM. All these are actually broadcasted over the same access point, over the same physical device, but they appear as four or five different wireless networks. So, uh, for each such wireless network, the access point broadcasts a beacon frame to the stations. And uh, upon receiving this beacon frame, actually, the, first of all, the station knows to which wireless network it is uh, joining. And the station now sets its uh, network allocation vector, remember, values to the maximum value as it is stated in the beacon frame. So in the beacon frame, the access point declares what that duration should be. So uh, this way the station knows how much uh, it will have this uh, contention free uh, period. So until the end of this period, all traffic is managed by the access point. That means during this contention free period, the stations refrain from using the DCF mode. They don't attempt to transmit even if the channel is available. It's reserved for uh, the point coordination function. So during this time, uh, the, uh, as we said, the access point is managing who talks when. So first the access point sends frames to the stations, uh, which are waiting for only a fifth amount, remember, uh, of time between the frames. And after its frames, the access point pulls every station by sending a contention-free uh, pole frame. So once again, at the beginning of the super frame, first the access point says, hello, this is access point number whatever, or this wireless network. And now our super frame starts with the contention-free period. So during this time, even if you see the channel available, please do not talk until I tell you to transmit. And then the access point first sends its own frame to the stations. In other words, a downlink transmission. So during the previous super frame, if there was anything received by the access point to be dispatched to the stations, it's now sending those. And after sending its frames, the access point now, one by one, pulls every station uh, sending a contention-free pole frame. Now, if the station which receives this CF pole frame uh, can send one frame uh, to the access point after the pole frame is received, and the polling ends at the end of the contention-free period. So uh, during that contention-free period, without going into contention with your neighbors, you're allowed to transmit for some given duration, determined by the access point. 
at the end of the contention free period, the contention period starts, and during this contention uh, period, actually what we have is that previous DCF we already discussed. So what this provides us is the following. During DCF, I don't know how much uh, time I will get to transmit. So especially if I'm trying to do soft or hard real-time communications, typically soft real-time communications, like sending or receiving video frames, uh, I don't know how much share of the uh, spectrum I will get, so the quality fluctuates. Depends on actually the activity of the other nodes, which is something I don't like, because I have no guarantees for that. However, during the contention fee period, I negotiate with the access point, so I know how much time I will get. It's dedicated, so it's predictable. Still, if it's not available, then I should play maybe with my encoding or uh, take some precautions for that. But I know what will happen. It's predictable. <clears throat> so this explains uh, how it's working. Let's look at an example scenario where station one wants to send something to the access point, similar for station two, and the access point wants to send something uh, to, the, uh, to station one. In this, under this scenario, <coughs> sorry, the access point waits for PIS duration, and following that, it sends the beacon frame. Every frame is separated by SIFs, so even if no one else is allowed to transmit, it will wait SIFs period, and then transmit a frame, transmits its, its downlink frame. To whom is it being sent? To station one. Okay. So everybody hears this, but they all see that this is destined to station one, so only station one acknowledges it after waiting for this. Note that uh, it doesn't receive a specific reservation for that. The access point knows that after receiving this packet, there will be an acknowledgement, so it will be waiting for it. Of course, the acknowledgement will be received only if this is successfully received. So, after this acknowledgement, the access point also waits for SIF and then sends its other frames, okay? And they are acknowledged, whatever. After sending these frames, uh, the access point waits for SIFs and then starts polling. Starts with station one. Do you have anything to send? Yes, it sends its frame, acknowledged. Now, poll station two. Station two will wait for sys, and then transmit. Acknowledge station two, saying, yes, I successfully received that. Poll station three. Station three has nothing to transmit. Well, unfortunately, in the beginning, we have declared how long all this PIS, uh, sorry, uh, PCF will work. So, since there's nothing more to send and everybody has sent his or her data, well, there will be no data frames for this situation, so it will remain idle. That's the problem, actually, with PCF. And at the end, uh, the access point announces that the contention free period has ended, so regular transmission now may start using DCF. So PCF is developed, as we said, for supporting quality of service. However, it increases the MAC overhead with the polling frames. If we go back to these slides, as you can see, these frames are the actual data being sent. Like, if you just look at the slide, this is the real data that's being sent. The rest is actually overhead. Well, you always have some overhead for the acknowledgement. We cannot avoid that. But there is also additional overhead. By the way, of course, please note that this figure is not to scale. Of course, the length of the poll message is not that close to the frame. Typically, it's, of course, much, much smaller. But still, there's overhead. The more important thing is you have to stop and wait for that poll message. OK? Also, uh, if you look at these slides, you will see that 
most of the time, there is no real data transmission. It's either overhead packets or frames being sent, like acknowledgement and poll or others. And also, there are so many wait times. That is why, remember, in the beginning of the chapter last week, we discussed that your raw data rate might be high, but your actual perceived data rate will typically much lower. That's because of this, because of these overheads and weightings. Okay? Those raw data rates are found assuming that there is no contention, no weighting, no acknowledgement, nothing. You just send one bit after another. You're filling all this time. If the protocol had allowed this, you'd be achieving that raw data rate. But due to the protocol, your real data rate will drop. This is PCF, so there's no contention here. But remember last week we discussed DCF. In DCF, as the number of nodes increases, that overhead due to waiting, mostly, and sometimes collisions, will be so high that after some point, after some number of subscribers, the network will really perform very poorly. Okay? So, as we see, it increases the MAC overhead in the system due to the polling frames, and most importantly, it's generally not implemented in many access points and stations. Actually, lately, uh, it's been more and more implemented. Now, as with any wireless system, we need to talk about the hidden node and exposed uh, terminal problems. You probably know this, but let me just uh, uh, remind this very fast. The hidden node problem is caused by the case that there are two stations both in the range of the same access point but not in the range of each other. That means the stations are not hearing each other but they both hear the access point. Typically one is to one side of the uh, cell while the other is to the other side. So the problem is when one station sends a frame to the access point the ex uh, other one thinks that the medium is idle since it cannot hear the transmitter and it will send a frame to the access point, but these frames will collide, so the access point will not be able to properly receive any one of these. And the solution to that is, as you know, the request to send, clear to send mechanism. Uh, so for the request to send, clear to send mechanism, assume that there's a hidden node in the network, so one node tries to send a frame to the access point. Instead of sending the data frame, this time the node sends first a request to send message frame to the access point and the access point will look at what's going on. If there's no one else that is scheduled to transmit at the moment, the access point will say, okay, it's clear to send now. That means the channel is clear, you may send. And upon receiving the clear to send message, the transmitter may transmit. But when the other node, when the access point transmits a message. Remember, also, the other node, the hidden node, will also hear that. And although it doesn't receive the RTS message from the transmitter, from the clear to send message, it understands that someone plans to transmit. And it is allowed to transmit by the access point. Therefore, uh, no need to receive the RTS. From clear to send, it knows that there, there will be a transmission, so it will refrain from transmission. For how long will it refrain? Well, in the CTS message, for, first of all, in the RTS message, the transmitter tells the size of the frame it's going to send, and in the CTS message, the access point repeats it. Well, tr the transmitter already knows how long it will be. That uh, length field in the CTS message is actually meant for the others. Those who have not heard the RTS, but they have received the CTS, they will, from CTS, understand how long the transmission will be, so they will set their network allocation vectors accordingly so that they don't transmit during that time. So that's an example. The access point is between station one and station two. They both want to send. 
So station phone, let's say, first attempts to transmit. First of all, it will wait for this before any transmission. The channel is idle. So it will first send the RTS. Then the access point will uh, say it's clear to send uh, since uh, after waiting for SIFS. And then waiting for SIFS, station 1 may transmit. At this point, station 2 may decide to send something. It will first sense the channel. It will hear the CTS message. And afterwards, it will, hearing the CTS, it will say, OK, this will be busy for this time. OK? So it will set its, in its uh, network allocation vector that there will be no uh, transmission. There, I should not transmit for this duration. Only after that, it will wait for this again for the availability of the channel. And then sense and transmit. So the network allocation vector is set to this value if you get the RTS. Now, what's that value? If I hear the RTS, the length of the silence period in the network allocation vector should be what? I should consider CTS plus whatever the length of the frame is. I know that from RTS, actually. In RTS, I've heard that. So CTS plus frame plus an acknowledgment plus SIFs, 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 three SIFs. Only after that, I can start for this. So in, in addition, now this is what you put in the network allocation vector. After that, you again have the diffs. In the case of missing the RTS because you didn't hear it, but uh, receiving the CTS, in that case, it is the data frame, acknowledgment, and one, two SIFs. OK? Uh, another problem, as you know, is the exposed terminal problem. So now we have stations 1, 2, 3, and 4. Station 2 wants to send to station 1, and station 3 wants to send to station 4. This is for the ad hoc case, typically. Since the stations do not have directional antennas, they have omnidirectional antennas, whatever station 2 transmits is received both by station 3 and station 4. So when station two transmits, station three will think that the transmission from station two will harm the transmission it's trying to make station four. Actually, that wouldn't be a problem because station four is far enough from station two. The signal due to station two would actually fade out and it would appear as noise, simple noise to station four and could be to tolerated there. But unfortunately, Station 3 will avoid transmission, although there is no problem with the transmission. So that is the case. So Station 3 cannot send its frame since it thinks it will collide, though there is no collision. In the physical layer for uh, ato 11 in the very beginning, we had, as we said, the infrared system. Well, it was not mostly implemented. ATO2, original ATO211 had frequency hopping spread spectrum and direct sequence spread spectrum implemented. Then, with later technologies, with ATO211 A and G, we also had orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. Uh, some common modulation schemes that are used in transmission are Modulation by amplitude, the idea is actually the following. Now, first of all, since most of you are not electrical engineering students, but computer engineering students, uh, you should get this concept right. You're trying to send information, send data. Take it as simply ones and zeros, as bits. Now, on some feature of that electromagnetic signal, you should create a differentiation so that one level of that feature, whatever that feature is, represents zero. And another one represents one. The simplest and the most straightforward one for that would be modulating the amplitude. That means one level of the amplitude represents zero. Let's say the lower level. And if you increase the amplitude, then it represents one. 
Okay? So that's one approach. Unfortunately, due to the fading in the environment, it's not working very well for long dis longer distances. Okay? Another one is uh, modulating by the phase. By the way, the first one is called amplitude shift keying. That's what ASK stands for. The second one is PSK, phase shift keying. In that case, you modulate by the phase. That means during the symbol duration, for us the symbol is, let's say, simply one bit. In the future, we'll see it could be different. Uh, so for a simple case, when we assume one symbol is equal to one bit, during the symbol uh, duration, you have a transmission, you have a sinusoidal signal. At the beginning of the next symbol duration, you cause a shift uh, in phase. That's why it's called phase shift keying. Now, according to in which direction and how much that shift is, you decide whether the next one is a zero or one. Okay? So this time, I'm implementing the transmission of the information, transmission of the data, now on, the, on modulating or changing the phase. Similar could be done for frequency. At some frequency, if you, the received signal is at a given frequency, I consider it as zero. For one, I transmit at a different frequency. This time, the signal uh, is not changing in amplitude. In the first one, the amplitude was changing. In the second one, there was a shift in the phase. In the third one, now amplitude is the same, phase is the same. So between the symbol durations, there's no shift in the phase, but only the frequency changes. So one frequency represents zero, the other one represents one. But you can use these in combination. Like you can use amplitude and phase together and you end up with QAM or sometimes pronounced as QAM, uh, QAM modulation, quadrature amplitude mod uh, modulation, or there's also the complementary code keying. So just to give you the basic ideas, uh, to show them better, like this is for QPSK, quadrature fa phase shift uh, keying. So during one symbol duration, you transmit a signal, then you change, remember, the phase. But I have now four different possible values. So the phase difference could be, for example, 0, pi over 2, pi, or 3 pi over 2. If it's 0, that means there's no change at the end of symbol duration. If it's pi over 2, that's a 90 degrees change, 180, whatever. So in that case, if I, if at the uh, border of the symbol durations, if there's a change, from that change, this time I don't understand one symbol, uh, sorry, one bit, but I understand two bits. So in other words, in one symbol, I'm able to transmit two bit information. That we call two bits per symbol, right? Okay, so for example, I could say, this represents 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, and 1, 0. Okay? So if I detect that, for example, uh, the phase has changed by, let's say, pi, I will say I have received two bits, 1 and 1. If I detect next time a phase shift by pi over 2, I will say I have again received two bits, the first one is zero, the second one is one. Okay? In the case of uh, QAM16, there are different versions of this. You have to, yeah, uh, QAM16, uh, 64, 256, whatever. This time, each, uh, now as you can see actually, this is an extension, QAM is an extension to QPSK, but this time amplitude is also in place. Like, this is one phase value, okay? But in addition, you also have the amplitude, okay? So if the received signal is close to this one, 
you can conclude that you have received four bits. One, 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 one. If you have received something close to this one, you may con conclude it is one, zero, one, one. Of course, during transmission, there could be errors due to noise and other uh, causes of distortion. Now, due to the distortion from noise, it is possible that what was transmitted was 1111. However, at the receiver side, it was received somewhere here. And the receiver may conclude that it has received 1011. So that would be, for example, an error in one bit. That's something you need to cope with. First of all, you should detect the error. It shouldn't go undetected. And then you should have mechanisms for fixing the error, like either with the retransmission or using for the correcting codes. OK? Now, if you increase the modulation, like go to uh, QAM 64 or 256, then that means you will have these points even closer. As this, these points gets, get closer and closer, you're able to fit in more points, which means the number of bits per symbol increases. In other words, your data rate increases. That's good. However, if the channel is not good, in that case, it is possible that what was transmitted would be slightly, of course, due to noise. Uh, received in a different way, but since these points are now closer, it is highly probable that it will be misunderstood at the receiver side, which means the error rate will increase if the channel goes bad. Now, if you're sure that your channel is in very good condition, that requires measurements. If you're sure about your channel, then you can switch to higher uh, modulation schemes and transmit at higher data rates. Mm -hmm. However, if your channel starts going bad, like the interference increases, for example, due to another transmitter nearby, in that case, you should detect that the channel is going bad. The simplest way of detecting that would be looking at your error rate. You decide to go to a more robust modulation scheme in which these points <coughs> sorry these points are further from each other so that it is less likely that due to noise the uh, received signal will be misinterpreted okay so better channel means higher modulations closer points in the constellation so higher data rates but as the channel go, goes bad, you have to, first, uh, when you start having errors, you first try to cope with the errors. If you detect that the error rate is really high, in that case, you should fall back to more robust modulation schemes. Just for the sake of completeness, let's talk about frequency hopping spread spectrum. As I said last week, this is also used in Bluetooth. So it's actually still in use, not in Wi-Fi, but in wireless pens. It was used in the case of Wi-Fi by the legacy 80211 system. Instead of sending the symbol using a fixed frequency, you jump from one frequency to the other, actually. Okay. Meanwhile, other stations in the area, they also jump from frequency to frequency. The point is, as long as two stations do not transmit at the same frequency at the same time, there's no collision. So this is just like we have stepping stones on the floor. You're jumping from one to the other. There are also other people in the same room who are also jumping over these stepping stones. As long as two people do not try to step on the same stone at the same time, there's no problem. If they do, then they collide. But after you have stepped out of a stone, someone may step into that stone. That's no problem. Okay, so you're allowed to use the same frequency, but not at the same time. That's the idea. Now, the important thing is, now I have to give each one of you 
the sequence of jumping from one frequency to the other. So I have to provide it in a way that there will be no collisions or fused collisions. The advantages are it is resilient against jamming in the narrow band because if you have some jamming or inter high interference, let's say in this range, only the frequencies here will be affected, whereas the others still continue. That means during the transmission, as long as you're not transmitting here, you don't have any problems. When you come here, of course you will experience some problems, but with other mechanisms, you can fix those errors. It's resilient against narrowband interference, as we said. It does not affect transmissions using the same frequency band. So you could have multiple transmitters, multiple stations at the same band. The disadvantages are the channel is not used, uh, utilized effectively. Take it this way. If I'm the only one who is uh, using this spectrum, why am I jumping? What if I used several of them, merged several of these frequency bands together and transmitted a fixed time all the time at these frequencies? It would be better than using one slot or one band at a time. I would be able to use, let's say, five of those merged bands together. Uh, it would work fine if there are multiple nodes that are uh, jumping. In that case, at any point in time, several of these frequency bands would be in use. But as that number is increasing and increasing, there is a breaking point. After some point, they will start colliding. So uh, you cannot increase it indefinitely. So there is a limit to that. And the transmitter and the receiver must be fully synchronized with respect to time and frequency. That means if you're sending me at this frequency, at time unit, let's say, T5, but I'm not expecting you there at that moment because of the cut drift, let's say, at the sender and uh, receiver side, then I will not be able to receive it. Also, our frequencies should be properly aligned. In other words, when you say 500 megahertz, you really mean 500 megahertz. Depends on your crystal quality. Same for my device. So our devices should be synchronized both in frequency and in time. Uh, direct sequence spread spectrum is actually the logic behind the co-division multiple access, CDMA, as you have heard. So it is uh, good for the narrow band based trans, uh, sorry, uh, it is also resilient to some interference. So the narrow band based transmission is spread upon a much wider bandwidth. That means the following. This is the narrow band based signal. That means what you actually want to send, what you intend to send. In regular systems, like consider the FHSS in the previous slide. So in each time, actually what you're sending would be such a narrow band base signal. Now what we're doing is actually assume this is just a block of butter and you press it from the top so you spread it. That's why it's called spread spectrum. You take this and stretch and spread it to a wider spectrum so that instead of this, so we have this one, so that at the other side, at the receiver side, intended receiver or other neighbors, what you have received is this much. So it's, for the unintended receivers in the environment, it appears as some noise at low power, but spread to a wider spectrum. Now, if you're not the intended receiver, for you it will be like some noise. Of course, it will add up to the existing noise. So it will increase your noise floor, but not too much. Not as much as this one. Someone else is also uh, having some transmission. 
at the same frequency at the same time. That's important. You're transmitting at the same frequency at the same time multiple transmitters. So that one adds more onto the noise, more and more and more. Of course, there's a limit. If you have billions of people transmitting at the same time at the same frequency, that would be too much noise. So the number of transmitters is, of course, limited. But the existing thermal noise plus the interference due to these uh, other trans unintended transmitters, if that's below a certain value, at the receiver side, it's possible to still decode the intended signal. How? Because at the receiver side, you receive all these layers of interference, actually, from all transmitters. Take the combined signal and multiply it with a specific code. All of them will remain spreaded except for the intended one, which will be spread. And from the spreaded signal, actually, you get back the original. Actually, this code is the same as the code that was used for spreading. So the spreading code and the spreading code are the same. So actually, what happens is you take the base signal, multiply it with your code, you get the spreaded signal. But at the receiver side, you get the noise, plus such spreaded signals from multiple transmitters. And you're not able to differentiate in between. You cannot say this one is from this user, this is from the other. You just get the combined signal. Just take the combined signal and multiply it with the one, with the code uh, of the user who you want to listen to. Only that one will be disappeared. The others will remain as spread, which means the others will serve as still noise for you. If the, the combined noise floor is not too high to stay in your SNR limit, then you can still decode the intended signal. That's a basic idea. Okay? So the advantages are, it's again resilient against jamming, resilient against narrowband interference. Of course, these two are related. It does not affect the transmissions using the same frequency band. Not written here, but a very important feature is you don't need to do frequency planning. Because peop uh, people, transmitters, are transmitting at the same time at the same frequency. In the case of Wi-Fi, this is not a major problem. This becomes a very important problem, especially in the case of cellular networks. Frequency planning is the most important problem, actually, in, the, in cellular networks. So this just helps the operators to avoid uh, frequency planning to some point, of course. If, as I said, the number of transmitters exceeds some limit so that your SNR uh, ratio uh, degrades, in that case, you're still in trouble. The disadvantage is channel is not utilized effectively. So later, yes. So about the previous slide, don't we need very very high speed switches and trans? Once again, we I think we will have to use some very high speed switches and transmitter in this DSSS because we are making the quite in the frequency band, so it will be very compressed in time domain. For instance, normally we want to send it data in one second. Here we have to send it in one millisecond or one microsecond since we are making a wider the frequency band. Uh, <coughs> it's still doable. You're, you're right in some sense, but it's doable. Uh, actually, IS-95 in the United States was CDMA-based. What's known as Sprint PCS. Uh, it's CDMA-based. Uh, what happens here is now, for example, to send a single bit, you send multiple chips. Because the code I was mentioning is composed of multiple chips. Let's say, for example, 64 chips. So instead of one bit, you're sending 64 chips. But in a wider band, yes, it requires some processing. But it is doable. As I said, it was doable 
in late 1990s and early 2000s, it's due will by today's technology. Then came OFTM. So 11 uh, megabps, we realized that that's not sufficient for us. Why? Because more people started using Wi-Fi. In the beginning, it was only you and me, but once people realize how good it is, then everybody starts using it. But then you see that there are so many users in this cell. Plus, as, uh, with the advance of the technology, also the applications become more bandwidth hungry. In the beginning, it was sufficient for us just to send email. Then we also had uh, the World Wide Web emerging, so it was, okay, email and gopher was not sufficient, so simple text space was not sufficient for us. We also started receiving some JPEG images or GIF images. In time, it turned out that, well, that's not sufficient. Okay, we want to put more and more. Now we have video, now it's going towards CD video, whatever. Okay, so we realize that 11 megabps is not sufficient. It's not comparable to what we had in the local area networks. Typically now, what we have on our desks is either 100 megabps or most of us even have now gigabps link on our desktop. And it's going toward 10 gigabps for the desktop. The backbone is already there. Even for the desktop, you're going there. And 11 megabps, remember, it's not even 11. This is again the row. The perceived would be around 3, 4 megabps aggregate for everyone in the cell, not for individuals. So we realize that this is far from being sufficient. So how can we increase it? It's, as I said, never possible to catch the wired case. But wireless provides us mobility and freedom. So we can tolerate some lower data rates, but it should be much higher than 11 megabps. So in order to increase the data rate, we, what we can do is we can increase the channel bandwidth but if you can find it. The spectrum is already uh, heavily partitioned. And what we have for ISM bands for free is very limited. Okay, so this is easier said than done. To do this, actually, you have to get the agreement from all countries in ITUR. In other words, all countries should agree on some new frequency band becoming available for, and that should be dedicated not to, let's say, GSM or uh, 3G, 4G operators, but to uh, ISM. Only in that case, we can increase the channel bandwidth. And that's very difficult. All these countries should agree, if possible, on the same band. If not, two or three bands maximum. Why? The reason is the following. The vendors would like to develop their devices for some specific frequency. You know, Tcom will not want to produce, uh, come up with one design for Turkey, another one for Greece, another one for Bulgaria, another one for France, and another one for uh, Germany. It's not feasible. They would like to come up with a single device, a single hardware, which works, if possible, for the whole world. If not, at least one design for, let's say, European area, larger European and Middle Eastern area, another one, let's say, Far East, another one for US, and that's it. I don't want to do more. Now, if Africa says, well, I want a four different band, they will just try to find out the number of possible customers in Africa, if it does not uh, compensate for the uh, efforts and the cost of having yet another design, they will not do it. So that means you have to stick with whatever is available. Okay? So increasing the channel bandwidth is a major problem. 
That's something we cannot easily do. So it's better to use less robust modulation techniques that will allow us higher data rates. Single carrier systems with high channel bandwidth are significantly affected by multipath propagation. That means the following. If you look at a single carrier system, that means at a specific central frequency, which can provide high channel bandwidth, good. However, due to multipath, that means when I'm talking, my signal, for, for this case, my voice signal, goes to Tural either directly, that would be line of sight, if we have it, but we have the camera in between, so we don't have line of sight with Tural, or it bounces from several different places. Now, if it bounces from several different objects, that means each signal is following a different path, and the lengths of these paths are different. Therefore, there will be a time lag between the received signals at two rules. And these will be, each copy of the signal will actually be distorting the other. So somehow, he has to be able to deal with these multiple copies of the same signal coming over multiple paths. So that's a, a major problem. The air interface is not as stable as the wire interface. That means as I'm talking, my, although I might be, assume I was transmitting with the same power, with a constant power, and look at the receiver, and assume that there are no other objects moving around. Even in that perfect case, the received signal strength will fluctuate. It will also fluctuate in the wired case, but in the case of wired uh, connections, the fluctuation will be much, much less compared to the wireless case. The wireless medium is unfortunately terrible. So using less robot techniques results in performance because as I explained earlier in the QAM case, if the channel goes bad, then it's very likely that you will misunderstand what I've transmitted. Okay, so that would cause an error in decoding. So the performance varies significantly with environmental conditions, which means the quality also fluctuates. So that's where OFTM, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, came from. The advantages are, since robust modulation techniques are used, adaptability to severe channel conditions is high. Okay? And the channels are orthogonal to each other, so that they don't interfere too much with each other. So it's robust against narrowband co-channel interference. Co-channel interference is the interference you experience due to nearby channels. Because the transmission from the nearby channels actually, unfortunately, even if there's filtering, leak into your uh, channel. So it's robust also against fading because you have multiple channels. So if this one fades, at that moment, the other one is probably good. Next time, that one may, that one may suffer, but this one, this time, will be good. Okay. So the basic idea is actually you have many options. If one is bad, the other one is good. So it's robust against fading caused by multipath propagation and high intersymbol interference values. Intersymbol interference is the interference from the previous symbol to the current symbol. It has high spectral efficiency. In other words, it uses the spectrum better. And it allows single frequency network capability because actually there are multiple frequency bands, but altogether they serve as a single spectrum for you. So you don't need to make any plans. You give the same set to everyone, everyone is actually using the same set. The disadvantages are it's sensitive to frequency synchronization. Well, it's a newer technology and with newer uh, devices we are able to provide this. And it's sensitive to Doppler shift, which means the effect of the moment. Because as you're moving, your speed 
also contributes uh, to the frequency of your transmission, depending on the direction of the moment. So that will also change the frequency. And it requires expensive circuitry. Well, it's, it used to be more expensive. Now it's more affordable, as I said, with the advance of the technology. So multipath propagation is actually what we have discussed. This is the transmitter. This is the receiver. This line is what we call the line of sight. We'll just show it as LOS. Line of sight is good as long as you have it. Most of the time, you don't have line of sight. Like at the moment, you don't have any line of sight with the base station for your cell phones. Actually, you don't even have line of sight with the access point, which is at the beginning of the corridor because of these walls. So most of the time, unfortunately, we don't have line of sight, especially if you're talking about urban areas. And there's also reflections and refractions from all other objects in the environment. Okay? And these all, uh, what the receiver receives is actually a combination of all these. And since some take longer paths, they will be shifted in time. So the peak of the signal will also be shifted. So if you look at the superposition of these copies of the signal, the, the combined signal will actually uh, be much different from what was transmitted. So the signals generated by the transmitter are received by the receiver traversing different paths. And coming from these different paths, they received at different times, as we mentioned. Intersymbol interference, ISI, uh, is, as I said, the interference caused by the previous symbol on the current symbol. This is like the sender is sending a sequence of bits to you. The first bit, unfortunately, gives harm to the second one, and the second one gives harm to the third one. It goes in this way. So if t is the duration of the shortest transmission path, which means the line of sight, if you have it. And T max is the duration of the longest transmission path. Since T max is greater than or equal to T, the multipath property adds an interference to all transmissions. And uh, of course, to the symbols during the duration. So the ratio between these two values is called the intersymbol interference. And in order to cope with the intersymbol interference, you should have an equalizer at the receiver, which will compensate for this. Actually, just delay the one, for example, you receive from the shortest path. To, uh, so they will now be aligned, and you will have a better signal. So to combat the larger intersymbol interference values, you need more powerful equalizers, which will be a little bit more expensive. So. Uh, if the transmission is sent through a single carrier, the intersymbol interference will be T max over T. However, if the same transmission is sent through N carriers, now intersymbol interference is T max over N times T, where N is <coughs> one or greater. Therefore, the denominator will get larger as N increases. Therefore, intersymbol interference will decrease. So this reduced intersymbol interference can be attained with the use of guard intervals. And the guard interval uh, can be explained as follows. The single carrier signal is, carried, uh, is transmitted sorry, in multiple subcarriers in parallel. But the subcarriers are orthogonal to each other. That means for the subcarriers, which are side by side, I don't pick the center uh, frequencies randomly. They're aligned in a way that, uh, where is it? OK, let me look at this. We'll come back to the previous slide. Like A, B, C, D, E are now the sub-channels. We focus on C, for example, the one at the middle. It, B, the frequency of B is selected according to C, such that if you look at the remaining lobes here, due to B, the green one, if visible, the other is here are actually corresponding to other 
lobes from the other signals. So they're aligned in a way that these almost cancel out each other so that one ch subcarrier does not give too much harm, like B does not give too much harm, if you look, follow the green one, does not give too much harm to C because this red is cancelling it. Okay, that's how these frequencies are selected. Such frequencies are called orthogonal frequencies. Okay, so if you can select these in the appropriate manner, you will minimize, not completely diminish, but you will minimize the uh, interference due to the uh, subsequent uh, or neighbor subcarriers. So each, so what we have done is instead of having a single carrier signal, now we have divided into subcarriers, and on each subcarrier we are sending different symbols. So each subcarrier now uses a low symbol rate modulation scheme. You have now narrower bands, and the guard interval is inserted between the symbols. These guard intervals typically reduce the inter symbol interference, and uh, they also reduce the signal susceptibility to time synchronization problems because according to the guard intervals you can better you know, synchronize. So if you look at the transmission typically for uh, a 4 mil microsecond symbol duration, the first 0 0.8 microsecond will be serving as a guard time against the previous symbol. Like if you look at this one, now, this, uh, the next symbol here will again have a 0 0.8 microsecond guard symbol uh, to cope with that. And for the rest, actually, you have the real transmission. So in the receiver side, fast Fourier transform is calculated only using what has been received during this time. This part is just discarded. This is a little bit explaining the uh, orthogonality between the subcarriers, but uh, also related to the uh, guard time. So if you consider this one, now this is the guard time we have, and this is where we have the real transmission. So altogether this would be 4 microseconds. And then we have the next symbol. Uh, this we have already discussed, so the single carrier, as we said, is split into multiple subcarriers, which are orthogonal, and being orthogonal to each other, now there is nearly no crosstalk between subcarriers. So let me stop for the moment uh, here, and we'll have a short break, and after that we'll continue from this slide. Okay, so. How do we calculate the bit rate in an OFDM system? Let's look at an example case. So we look at the symbol duration as in the previous slide, we take it as four microseconds. And assume there are 48 subcarriers that are carrying data. And let's also assume that we are using 64 QAM. Since uh, 64 is two to the six, then that means you're coding six bits into each subcarrier. Since we have 48 such, such uh, subcarriers, in total, uh, during one symbol duration, you're actually sending 288 bits. Okay. Uh, let's say your coding rate is 3 over 4. That means out of every 4 bits, 3 is real data, and 1 is used as a redundancy <coughs> for forward error correction. So out of these 288 bits sent, actual data is carried in only 216. This is during one symbol duration, but one symbol duration was four microseconds. So I'm sending 216 bits per four microseconds. And if you divide this, you end up with 54 megabp. Remember, this is the data rate of 802.11g. That's how it works, actually. It's working with four microsecond symbol durations, uh, with 48 uh, subcarriers, and at most it's using 64 QAM. <clears throat> now, 
uh, there are different data rates uh, in OFTM, uh, actually in uh, HOT11, let me say, that support OFTM. It's like in the worst channel case, you're using binary phase shift keying. That means in uh, a difference of pi degrees between two possible values. One represents zero, the other one represents one. That's why it's binary. Uh, your coding rate is one over two. So out of two, every two bits, one is for real data, one is for redundancy, which means your redundancy rate is too high. Uh, this, is, this corresponds to 50% of redundancy. That's terrible, actually. Uh, so if you look at, forget about the coded bits uh, per symbol, first uh, you should look at the final output, which is uh, 24 data bits per symbol. Okay. Now as the channel gets better, you go down. Okay. Like with the same modulation, now you can decrease your redundancy. So out of four uh, bits, three of them are for data. One is only for redundancy. In that case, your data rate increases by 50%. If it's better, now you can switch to QPSK. That means now the difference between two symbols is not necessarily by pi degrees, but it could be pi or two degrees. So you have four different options. In other words, two bits per symbol. Again, for different coding rates, you get higher and higher data rates. Then you go for 16 QAM, and finally for 64 QAM. And that is what you get. And that's actually what we have calculated, which corresponds to 54 megabps. So as the channel gets worse, you go up. As the channel gets better, you go down. Over rows are for better channels, and they result in higher data rates, whereas upper rows correspond to worse channels. So they are more robust, more tolerant to errors and noise, but they provide lower data rates. Now, <clears throat> if you look at uh, interchannel interference, that's actually due to the uh, close by channels. Uh, although we said there are 14 channels in uh, ATO211, actually we are using only three of them. Okay? Generally. It is possible to configure your access point. Now, normally we try to co uh, configure all access points to channels 1, 6, and 11. But you might see that a curious neighbor who's just curious but has no idea how these things work might say well why am i working at one let me switch to seven now if that neighbor switches to channel seven this is channel six pay attention he would be transmitting with such a signal that would create too much interference both on channel six and also somewhat in on channel 11. the best would be organizing all your neighbors. So I said, the SSIDs, the number of transmissions, is evenly distributed between these three channels. These three channels are actually selected such that the interference between each one of these is minimized in the given band of, uh, band of uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, if you can do that, that's perfect. But previously, when I used to live at Fenaryolu, uh, I once did a site survey to see uh, how many uh, transmissions we had. I was living in an apartment by then. And then I realized that there were 27 good strength neighbors around. Of course, all of them encrypted. So everybody is using his or her own network. That's fine. But since most of these devices are coming on channel 1 by default, as a factory default, out of 27, something like 23 or 24 were operating on channel 1. Some were on channel 6, 
And there was only one guy at Channel 11. So I was the second. I also went to Channel 11 because there was less, less competition there. Now note that even if you have, less, you can run, by the way, 50 <coughs> or 100 Wi-Fi networks all on the same channel, let's say on channel one. That's fine. They could work. What happens is the following. Everybody's Wi-Fi access point, once in a while, transmits the beacon saying, I'm network with this SSID, whatever the name of the network is. It will broadcast the SSID. I'm working on channel one, as you can see, since we could receive this beacon. This and that, that information on the beacon. As long as those 100 networks are not very active, <coughs> like, OK, at the moment I'm here, but my Wi-Fi device is actually left switched on. Actually, I should have switched it off, but I normally forget to do that. Now, there, if, you just, uh, if you're just nearby and try to sense the channel, you will see that my Wi-Fi network at home is operational. But there's no transmission because everyone is actually in office. My wife is in office. My daughter is in school. I'm here. So no one is using it. Only the once in a while we hear the beacon signals. That's fine. But it still counts in that 100. But if you have 100 networks, there will be some people who are at home at the moment. And they will be using their channels. Now, if they transmit, remember all the discussions with, we had with PIFs and this and the others? That's valid only in one SSID. So if you're both working on the same network, on the same, we're connected to the same wireless network, in that case, when I'm transmitting, you refrain from transmitting for safe duration. Okay. Meanwhile, at the same frequency, at this, almost the same location, you could have some other transmission. Okay? That could work. But now they're, of course, interfering with each other. Like, it could be that there is another SSID at the same location using the same frequency band. So when I want to transmit, what happens? I first sense the channel. Which channel? Channel 1. And my device says it's in use. Come on, I'm the only one in this network. How could it be in use? Well, it is in use by the other network, actually. So all this discussion we had about PCF, DC, uh, the PC, on the PCF side, there was no uh, contention. But with the DCF, actually, don't forget that there could be other people, other networks working at the same frequency band. So even if there are no other nodes in the network, you could still be waiting because there are other nodes in the environment. Okay? So it is better if you take your network to one of the unused bands, but not to something between 1 and 6 or between 6 and 11. Choose one of these. If everyone abides with these rules, that's the best for all of us. All of us. Of course, you could go to a crazy environment where everyone says, OK, we're not using 1, 6, and 11. We want to use 2, 8, uh, 10, whatever. Then that could be different, but that's hopefully not what's going on, really. Now, in 802.11, <coughs> we have the EDCA uh, mechanism. Uh, so we're going to discuss that. That's introduced, as I said, in 802.11e. It's basically an enhanced version of DCF to provide quality of service. It adds quality of service support on top of DCF. There are four types of different types of <coughs> traffic. Each one of these is called an access category. We'll uh, talk about as AC. These are for best effort. Video probe, video, and voice. Uh, don't let uh, the phrase best effort mislead you. Best effort is typically the worst. This is like, this is the best I can do. Uh, so it's not really the best. 
The stations with call to service support will be called QSTA, and the access points that enable this will be called QAP. So in each uh, call to service enabled station, there are four different queues, one for each of these four uh, access categories. And each queue contains for medium access as if it's a separate station. Okay, so this is like actually four virtual stations inside one actual physical station. And the queues from different access categories have different medium access uh, parameters like interframe separation, uh, minimum and maximum contention window size. So these parameters are typically defined and broadcasted by the access point. And the uh, interframe separation, uh, as I said, it's different for each access category. Uh, so these are called AIFSDs. So AIFSD for some access category AC is the typical SIF. You have to take it. On top of that, uh, you add AF, uh, AIFSD, uh, AIFS, sorry, offset access category. And for the uh, congestion window sizes, each queue starts with a different minimum congestion window size. And depending on the access uh, category, it calculates the back-off duration. And the maximum size of the back-off is also different for each access category. <coughs> so as I said, the station acts as if it has four virtual uh, stations are inside one physical station. So therefore, there's a virtual collision handler. That means the following. When you want to transmit, if you had transmitted, there would be a collision. So you don't let it collide, but you act as if it has collided because there's no real transmission inside the station itself. So uh, if there would be a collision among multiple access categories, the frame from the highest priority level is chosen, typically, and that one is transmitted. So you have four different access categories, and you have their queues, each with its own back of AFS, uh, AIFS and uh, uh, other parameters, let me see. And the virtual collision handler will just look at these, and from these, if there's no collision at any point, let's say uh, access category two had something to transmit and the others didn't, it will just pass through. But if there's a collision, it will pick the one with the higher priority. So let's look at an example scenario. We have three, uh, sorry, two uh, QSTAs, QSTA one and two, and each one has different access categories. We have one packet from um, third access category of Q station. Uh, a, Q station one, QSTA one, and these from the other. So, this is the access point, and the others are the others. So, <clears throat> initially, the first one waits for AFSD three, and this one also uh, wants to transmit. But note that these are from the real, from the same station, okay? So that station realizes that there would be a collision. So they will both back off. This has shorter back off. So when this back off expires, this one starts transmission. At that moment, in the middle of this transmission, Q station two also has something to transmit, okay? So this will start waiting. It knows, it senses till the end of the frame. It knows there will be an acknowledgement after this. There comes the acknowledgement. And after that, uh, they will both uh, wait for some time and then uh, continue with their back offs. When this, one, when this back off expires, of course, this, these all depend on 
what those back of values are. I will later on provide you an example with the times. Uh, so this one transmits. Then the acknowledgment, as before, actually, there's not much difference. The remaining part of the back of goes in here, and then the transmission of the frame. Now in here, we have two uh, virtual nodes, actually. Two access categories from the same station trying to transmit to the access point. So in here, there will be a collision. So the virtual collision handler chooses access category one due to priority. And it will transmit that one. Still, you have to wait for the acknowledgment before you can start with the other. So a 11 e also defines what's called a transmission opportunity. We'll show this TXOP. And the access point broadcasts the transmission opportunity length for each access category. When a station uh, wins the contention for an access category class, it can send frames belonging to that access category class as the length of the transmission opportunity of the same uh, access category. Inside the transmission uh, opportunity, the station only waits for SIFs before sending frames. <clears throat> A2211E also provides what we call the hybrid controller function, HCF, controlled uh, channel access. So in total, it's called HCCA. This is one abbreviation inside the other. It's an enhanced version of PCF. So it's similar to the access categories in EDCA. Now they're the traffic classes rather than access categories in HCCA. And different traffic classes belong to different uh, traffic streams. Similar to the contention period and the contention free period we discussed earlier in the case of point coordination function, there are now two periods. That's a collision period and a controlled access phase. The collision, free, uh, sorry, the collision period is a period in which you run the EDCA uh, period. And during the controlled access phase, the con uh, you do not have fixed durations and fixed places in the super frame. So the access point now initiates the controlled access phase to send a number of frames to its specific station. Okay. And the uh, access point can also initiate a uh, controlled access phase to pull a station to send its frames. So first, again, the access point sends the frames to the station and then may ask the station if it has anything to send. ACCA can pull uh, stations on a traffic uh, class basis. And each station has a maximum of eight traffic classes. The traffic and the QS parameters of each traffic class is sent to the access point during the initial phase, what's called the traffic class establishment. And uh, access point enables the uh, caps using these parameters. And how these caps are scheduled is left undefined in the standard that is yet another uh, room for extension for individual uh, vendors uh, who are uh, producing these devices. I'm sorry, let me change the batteries. They're getting weaker. So the trans Transmission opportunities can also be used in uh, HCCA. In this case, when the access point sends frames to its station or pulls a station for its uplink frames, the sender can send as many frames as it, as it can fit in the transmission opportunity of the selected trans, uh, traffic class. Again, similar to PCF, implementation of HCCA is not mandatory in 802.11e. <clears throat> in 802.11e, there's yet another improvement 
or flexibility, let's say, which is the direct link protocol. Remember, normally when you want to send one uh, frame to a neighbor station, which is just a few meters away, you have to go through the access point. You send it in the uplink to the access point, then the access point will send it in the downlink to the destination. Okay. Now, if two stations in the same cell try to communicate with each other, as we said, typically all traffic is going through access point. So this is actually causing a, twice the traffic that you need. You have to go uplink and then downlink. If these stations are in range with each other, why not should they directly communicate with each other rather than wasting twice these resources? So using DLP, these two stations can communicate directly with each other. But this is initiated over the access point initially, as you'll see now. The sender first sends a request frame to the access point. It cannot directly communicate with the destination because there is no link set up at the moment. And the access point forwards this to that station. Now, if the station allows this transmission, if it wants to set up a direct uh, link, it sends an acknowledgement, a response to the access point, and this is finally related to the originating uh, station. Then the two stations communicate with each other using a direct connection with each other. There is more detail into this. We'll not go into that detail, but just know that this is possible because you have to make sure that when those two stations are communicating, it's not uh, causing interference with the others. So when they're talking, the others shouldn't, whatever. There's another uh, improvement is block acknowledgement. Instead of, uh, if you look at the previous slides, uh, where we had discussions, remember, you send the frame, you wait for SIFs, then the receiver sends, the access point sends acknowledgement. Uh, you wait for SIFs, and then send the next one. Okay? Rather than doing that, instead of sending one acknowledgement for each transmitted uh, frame, the receiver sends one acknowledgement frame for one transmission opportunity. So, instead of sending an acknowledgement for every frame in the transmission opportunity, wait till the end of the uh, transmission opportunity and at the end say, yes, I received all of them. This will save us from two sets and one acknowledgement. And also, it's possible to have no acknowledgements. So, uh, if a frame enables no acknowledgement, uh, there will be no acknowledgement sent from the receiver to the data frame. Like, if it goes through, okay, fine. If not, I don't care. If it's not very important. Now, this was with how you do, for example, call to service. Remember, 802.11e was introduced for providing call to service. How about managing multiple nodes in a cell and then having multiple such cells. And how about moving between these? Okay? So, 8211 defines two basic service set options. One is the infrastructure basic service set, in which case you have one access point which serves all nodes in its area, which is called a cell. This access point typically has a connection, an uplink connection or wireless LAN uh, to the internet. And the other one was what we discussed as ad hoc mode, in, which is called the independent BSS, basic service set, in which there is no base station, these just communicate in between. Uh, the infrastructure uh, basic service set is uh, by far the most common uh, way of implementing wireless LAN. This is typically what we see. The problem with uh, the independent approach or the ad hoc approach is the following. First of all, how do you get to the internet? That's one of the major responsibilities of the access point. It's working as a concentrator for all these nodes, taking the requests from all of them 
and relaying them to the internet and then receiving the packets for all of the nodes in its cell, then dispatching them to the correct node. Okay? There is uh, no such means. Also, when you're in an ad hoc mode, that means there is no master-slave relationship, as in the case of the access point and its nodes. So coordinating access also becomes more difficult, especially since these are mobile, it becomes even more difficult because uh, one of the nodes may have left. Now, how do you reach the other? Like, if it, it's easy if you have only such three nodes, so that everyone is, has a connection, has a direct connection to the other two, to the remaining. But if you have more, you have some nodes here, and this one leaves, how do you find the new path over this one? Setting up the path itself is also difficult, but pay attention. 802.11 is working on which layers? Consider the OSI layers. Which layers does 802.11 address? Louder? Mac? Mac? There's no Mac layer. Mac is a sub layer, remember. Data link layer. This layer 2, okay? And? And physical, layer 1. How about layer 3? What was layer 3? Network layer. Does it say anything about network layer? No. So it just says, that's how you set up the links between two nodes. How do you find the new extension? Well, that means you should have another ad hoc networking protocol running on top of 802.11. And unfortunately, uh, such ad hoc routing protocols are not very effective. They're useful in the case there's no infrastructure. Because in that case, it's either like, well, you work with this uh, protocol or you don't have any connection at all. But for the uh, daily life, you'd prefer something that's more flexible. So uh, in the case of infrastructure basic services, which is what we're going to focus at, this is the most frequent one, uh, before the stations can start using the basic service set, first they should associate. It's an access point. That's what you call connecting to the network, actually. Your station introduces itself to the access point. Uh, the ad hoc mode is typically uh, of interest to military applications, because especially when you go to foreign lands for an operation, you don't make any reservations before. You're, you don't have the option to set up an infrastructure. And probably you're under fire. So you, you don't have a chance to set up the network. So it has to work in an ad hoc manner. And it has to be tolerant to failures. And it has to be, uh, provide mobility. No access point is therefore required. Actually, they don't want it. Uh, by the way, it's not only for military applications, by the way. It's also for disaster relief. Like an earthquake or a hurricane hits, all infrastructure is gone. In that case, again, uh, it's important to have an ad hoc network. In such cases, it's not important to download movies from YouTube. Okay? What you're trying to do in that case is mostly communication within the group, Sometimes you may also want to communicate with the, some central authority. In that case, one or two of the nodes serve as the routers for the group. They might typically have another technology you know, on another interface using, let's say, 3G or satellite or something else for that link. Uh, for our case, we're looking at the wireless LAN part of it. No access point is required, and the stations can communicate directly. Efficient routing of the packets is not a trivial problem. And as we discussed, 802.11 does not address layer 3. It doesn't say anything about that. It's your responsibility on whatever you run on top of 802.11 at all. 
There is also the concept of extended service set as opposed to basic service set. Note that the basic service set was for a single cell. In the case of extended service set, you have a larger wireless LAN network consisting of a number of basic service set networks, which are interconnected via some common backbone, typically, let's say, cable. OK? So you have the access points, several access points. Each one is serving a cell. And these are connected over some cable. Now, what's the difference between this and what you have in your apartment? Like, you have an access point at your home. Your neighbor has another one. Other neighbor has another one. What's the difference? Actually, all access points uh, on, uh, are connected to each other over the internet. The difference is that here, they all serve for the same network. This is like what we have in our building. We have 16 or more access points, but they all serve as one CMP. So that you can roam between these, independent on which floor or in which room you are, you're connected to CMP. You take your laptop and go to another one, you can continue working there, although you're working on another access point, which means you have moved to another cell. That's what the extended service set provides. So 802.11 supports link layer mobility, which means your link to the access point has moved to the other access point. That's what we call link layer mobility, but not outside the extended service set. It's not like you're here and then you know you just get out and you start communicating over uh, TTNet, Wi-Fi. That's something else. That's a different network. It works only within the ESS. So this is the mechanism by which the access points and other nodes in the wired IP subnetwork communicate uh, the distribution system uh, is providing this. So there is a router inside the same IP, pay attention, subnetwork, like inside CMP, you have a distribution system between the access points. Uh, with this communication using inter-access point uh, protocol, IAPP, uh, it's essential for link layer mobility, so that you can move from this access point to this one, but within this distributed system. So stations can seamlessly move between different BSS networks within the same ESS. For example, when a wireless station moves from one BSS to another, all nodes must update their databases so that the distribution system can distribute the packets via the correct access point. If you move from here to here, the distribution system should realize that the packets to you now should be sent over access point two, not one. So access point one, access point two, these two, and the router should all update their databases when this operation occurs. Why also the router? Because if the packet is to be sent to you over access point two, then the router should be sending those frames to access point two, not to access point one. Access point one also should stop sending to access point two. Uh, so, sorry, it should stop sending to your station because you have left this area. When the workstation associates with the new access point, the router in uh, charge of the IP subnet, the one here, which is in charge of this distribution system, obtains an IP address from the DHP server, okay, for this one. <clears throat> and the router must maintain some binding between this IP address, which is, remember, a layer 3 address, and the MAC address, which is a layer 2 address. So it should say, this IP belongs to this MAC address. Uh, so it does a binding, like, 
from the DHCP, what happened was this station was here, it moved here. It made a request and from the DHCP it receives an IP address. But the router also realizes this and it takes a note saying this IP address actually means this MAC, okay? which is the MAC of this workstation. Remember, the MAC addresses are globally unique. There should be only one machine all over the world with that interface. And it is used for routing the packets within the IP subnetwork. So the distribution system and the attached uh, BSS networks, that means this thing here and the Wi-Fi cells here, including the access points, all these are working according to these MAC frames in the MAC sublayer. The dynamic and the local IP address of the wireless station is only valid for the duration of the attachment when you attach to that network. And it's used for communicating with the outside world. So for the outside world, you're using the IP, but within the network, within the subnetwork, let me say, uh, you're, using, you're using the MAC addresses. But there's a minor problem. Now, this is actually what we already have. Okay? Consider a regular PC connected to this subnetwork. The router sends the packets put, by putting them in MAC frames. And in the MAC header, you put the source and the destination MAC addresses. The source MAC address will belong to this leg of this router. And the destination MAC address would belong to the MAC address of that PC, of the interface through which it connects to this LAN, for example. However, in the case of this workstation, it's not connected here, it's connected to this one. Now note that the packet, if it's sent with this destination MAC address, any PC is connected here, will ignore it. It's not destined for that one. This access point will also ignore it because it's not the MAC address of this access point. This one will also ignore it because it's not the MAC address of this interface. It's actually the MAC address of one of the nodes it's serving for. So it's the responsibility of this access point to keep track of that. It should not receive only frames coming to itself, but also to all nodes to which it's serving. But not to nodes that are served by access point one or other networks, uh, other nodes that are connected to this network. You understand it? It should remember, it should know its own MAC address and the MAC addresses of all associated nodes. Because the incoming frame <coughs> should be served for that one. So as we said, the router must also know and use the MAC address of the access point via which the packet must be routed. It should send it to the access point. So now, in addition to the IP number, you have the node's MAC address, but also the serving access point's MAC address. So for this purpose, that IAPP protocol is required. The IAPP protocol, which is defined in 802.11f, once again, this is not a standalone standard, it's just an addendum. It offers mobility in the data link layer within an ESSS, as we said. So uh, according to IAPP, a, uh, access points must be able to communicate with each other. They should be able to talk to each other when the station moves around in the wireless LAN. See, because this node, when it moves from here to here, access point one may suddenly lose connection with access point two without having the chance to communicate with, sorry, uh, it may lose the connection with the node without having, to, having the chance to say goodbye, okay? Therefore, 
when access point 2 receives an association request from the node, it should inform the other saying, hey guys, from now on, I'm serving this user, this node, okay? So IAPP provides that. So IAPP alone is not sufficient to enable seamless handovers in a wireless LAN. The stations must be able to measure the signal strengths from the surrounding access points and decide when and to which access point a handover should be performed. And 802.11 does not propose any solutions <coughs> for this. And in 802.11 networks, a handover means reassociating with the new access point. And there may be two kinds of problems. Will handover work when access points are from different vendors? That's one thing. Unfortunately, they're not working well. And will handover work together with security solutions? That's yet another thing. It's not going into the security part. Okay? So that would be all for uh, today. So uh, I will see you all next, not next week, sorry, as I'll be in Dublin the following week. I'll see you all. Okay, bye.